Everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and today we're going to talk about shooting from the vehicle. Pre-planning is the most important part of self-defense. Being able to avoid a situation before it develops is going to be more beneficial, obviously, than getting into a situation where you need to use force. Now, we can't control other people's actions, but what we can do is put ourselves as often as possible in the best situation to see what's coming and hopefully avoid it. When it comes to self-defense in the vehicle, situational awareness is huge. We get complacent. We end up looking at this at stoplights. We don't focus enough on the world around us when really it's not obviously labor intensive. It's something we can do very simply and it just requires us to pay attention. Passively paying attention is better than not paying attention at all. If you find yourself lost in your cell phone, snap out of it. If you find yourself lost in the radio, snap out of it. Take a look at the world around you. If you have to play a game in order to get your head on a swivel looking at the situation around you, especially in highly congested areas where a crime is more likely to occur versus a rural area where it's just a little bit less likely, I can put myself in a situation where I am at a disadvantage and I'm way behind the reactionary curve when a threat presents itself or a potential threat presents itself. Looking at my mirrors, making sure I'm aware of the situation around me, making sure I'm paying attention to vehicles, paying attention to faces, paying attention to body language of those standing on the curb, those standing on the sidewalk, what have you, I can put myself in a much better situation. Now, how do I snap out of being complacent? Uh, me personally, and I know I've mentioned this before, one of my favorite things to do is a game. I'm looking for something. I'm going to think of an object or, or a landmark or a type of color of a car or something like that, and I'm gonna look for it. If I find myself getting complacent, if I'm not paying attention, I'll be like, all right, look for the yellow car. Now, I may never actually see a yellow car, but I'm looking, and while I'm, oh, there's one right there. And as I'm looking, I'm observing the rest of the world. Now, I may focus it in a little bit more, find a guy wearing a green shirt. Now I'm looking at people versus vehicles. I'm gonna to continue to play this game to keep myself from getting complacent. And it's only a game until it turns serious. Now, when approaching lights, I wanna leave a half to a full car length between me and the vehicle in front of me in the event that I need to maneuver. The problem with this technique, of course, is in heavy traffic, someone might assume that that's enough room for them to get into, and then they pull into that position, they pull into that open space you leave, and now you're left with no room to maneuver except for turning to the right, or if you're in the far left lane and there's no wall divider or high center median turning to the left. Now, approaching the light, I'm going to give myself space to maneuver. I prefer the right lane because it will allow me to maneuver out of the lane of traffic in most situations. Obviously, that's not the case in some situations, some roads, uh, and it's something you have to be aware of. I want to place the vehicle in a position to where if something does happen, I have the ability to escape the situation without the need for violence. Proper position to your mirrors is also important. I want to stage my side view mirrors so that I can see the bottom door handle or the bottom of the rear corner panel. In that event, if someone is sneaking up the side of my vehicle, I'm able to see them. As far as the rear view mirror is concerned, I want to be able to either see the tailgate on a truck or the lid of the trunk to see if someone is behind the view. Now, most modern vehicles have auto-locking doors. Uh, if you have, for some reason, disabled that feature on your vehicle, I highly recommend you reinstate it because, especially with auto-locking doors, the advantage to those, obviously, is it doesn't allow someone immediate access. Another thing it does is it alerts you to the fact that someone is trying to make access to your vehicle if they're pulling on a door handle. Like I showed with you the mirrors, why I position them to where I can see the door handles is, one, I can see if someone's physically there, and two, it's highly unlikely that somebody's going to be able to crouch lower than the door handles I'm able to see in my mirror. I want to 
space them out as far as possible. I still want to see the side of the vehicle and as much to the left and to the right of the vehicle as I can. I want to see as many of those blind spots as I can. The rear view mirror, same thing. I want to be able to see if anybody's behind my vehicle. Uh, in carjacking situations, they may just approach you weaving, walking through traffic, or they may approach from the rear of the vehicle and come up to the driver's or the passenger side, depending on the situation. Uh, in conversations I've had with people who have been convicted of carjacking, uh, it, it can go either way. There is no definitive answer, but one thing I do know is those who carjack from the driver's side, at least, or the passenger side rather, those I've talked to, they'll do it at knife point or gun point or whatever, tell the person to put the vehicle in park, get out of the vehicle, and then that's when they come around and take control of the car. Are they going to walk around the front of the car and make a driver's side approach on the A-pillar? It's, it's unlikely, but it is a possibility. Now, we can't avoid traffic. We can't avoid putting ourselves in situations where we're more likely to have to defend ourselves inside the vehicle. It's just not realistic, it's not practical. You're gonna to have to travel on congested roads, you're gonna to have to sit at lights, you're gonna to have to do those things. So taking these pre-planning steps to best prepare yourself uh, to deal with the situation if a situation ar arises is gonna benefit you greatly. All right, so shooting from inside the vehicle, what are we talking about? Well, more likely than not, we're talking about a situation where you're in fear for your life, you're in fear for the safety of your loved ones. Um, situations such as a carjacking or a road rage situation uh, where someone is trying to attack you or successfully attacking you or, or you, you have the perception that they're about to attack you uh, and you feel like you need to defend yourself. Um, you have objective fear for your life, objective fear for your safety, so you're going to go ahead and defend yourself uh, the best you're able. Um, is this situation most likely to occur at low speeds or high speeds? Uh, I would say low speeds to stopped. Uh, the faster the vehicle is traveling, the less likely you are to need to defend yourself. Now obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but just speaking from shooting inside the vehicle, we're going to look at the techniques that address uh, successful weapon maneuverability inside the vehicle um, with an eye towards reality. Anyone can maneuver a muzzle successfully inside a vehicle when they expect to be inside the vehicle alone. That's how a lot of people practice. Now reality when you leave the range um, and you're driving to the store or the mall or where, where wherever you're going do you have anybody with you uh, a lot of us do spend some time in the vehicle alone especially traveling to and from work but if it's on a weekend or something like that do we have family members with us do we have loved ones with us do we have friends with us if you can maneuver the muzzle safely inside a vehicle when there's passengers present then you should have absolutely no problem maneuvering the muzzle inside the vehicle when you're by yourself now, this video isn't all about maneuvering the muzzle, but that's the primary intent because we need to think about where the, the attacks are most likely to come from and how best to confront them and how most efficiently and safely to do so. So we talked about pre-planning, recognizing the threat as soon as possible. Now let's look at actually getting the weapon either into the fight or getting the weapon ready for the fight that you know is coming is inevitable and you can't avoid. Uh, your draw path, um, driver's side, inside the waistband, outside the waistband, hip carry, uh, left-handed shooters are going to have an advantage because they won't necessarily have to worry about the seatbelt. A right-handed shooter may have to disengage the seatbelt before they're able to draw their weapon. Appendix carry, small of back, both of you are going to have significant body positioning challenges to draw the weapon, which is why I highly recommend, no matter where you carry, that you stage the weapon. Now, some states are a little weird about a, an exposed weapon in the vehicle. Um, the best thing to do is be familiar with your local laws, your state laws, what your CCW allows you to do, what have you. That being said, if you're able to, stage the weapon in a way that it's exposed, even if it's still on your person, and you're able to access it quicker. Uh, it's as simple as just pulling the shirt up and tucking it behind the, the holster or whatever you have to do to make sure the weapon's the most accessible and ready to go. Uh, so say, just for uh, example's sake, if I have to draw from the right side of my body. If my gun is exposed and staged and everything's already set up, I may still have to clear the seatbelt, which I can do with my support hand. It's as simple as just moving, undoing the seatbelt, and then you can get your draw path, bring your weapon out. If I'm working from the left side of my body and I have to clear the seatbelt, it's the reverse. I'm going to get my hand on my weapon, clear my seatbelt, swim out of it, and then I can get the weapon up. Now, appendix carry, the lap belt is more than likely going to be lower um, than the gun's position on your body even if you don't stage it. But if you have to swim out of it, just use your support hand. The most important thing about the seat belt when you're clearing a holster uh, is to not get your support hand wrapped up in it. Don't come on the inside unless you're going to use that to forcefully drag the seat belt across your body. My personal feeling is guide everything from the buckle itself versus using the belt. 
clearing the seatbelt, just push it over. Done. Um, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Okay, so the draw path. Uh, we'll start with right-handed shooters. I have my weapon staged. The shirt's pulled up over it, it's exposed, and it's sitting just behind the buckle of the seatbelt, which is where I ideally want it. Your carry position, um, you may adjust it in the vehicle. Uh, belt slide holsters, if you're carrying outside the waistband, are really great for that. Um, if you find yourself like you just have to carry it in a certain position, you're not willing to compromise, most people aren't going to have their gun right underneath the, uh, the seat belt itself. So the draw path shouldn't be affected. Now I recognize my threat, be it in the rear view mirror, the side view mirror, what have you. Um, I'm going to come off the weapon because I'm most likely going to be sitting on it. And then I just simply present my draw. Now what do I do with the weapon from here? I can bring it straight up and straight across and get ready to engage my threat. At that point, I haven't muzzled myself, I haven't muzzled any passengers. Really straightforward, really easy. As a right-handed shooter, you have a distinct advantage as a driver because you're not going to be compressed into this corner using your left hand as your primary shooting hand. Left-handed shooter, pretty much the same story. I don't have to worry about the lap belt. I don't necessarily have to clear the seat belt uh, based on my carry position. Obviously, everybody's body type is going to be different, so this is something you really need to practice. Uh, you don't want to be doing this for the first time for real. Same thing, recognize my threat, be it side view mirror, rear view mirror, visual, I see him in front, wherever he is, I can bring the weapon up, make sure it clears my body, and then I can bring it across the front if I have to shoot through the windshield, or I can corner in and engage my threat from the side. Appendix carry, not really an issue as long as the holster is staged. If your shirt's over it, your jacket's over it, your sweatshirt's over it, the seatbelt lap belt's over it, all those things are going to complicate and you're going to have to fight in your garments. You recognize your threat, you pretty much just regular draw stroke, bring it straight out, and then I can address it to the threat. Now, all of these are kind of static because we're not talking about passengers in the vehicle yet and we're not talking about engaging a threat in a atypical or a less than ideal uh, shooting situation. We're talking about front windshield, driver's side window, which are more likely than not going to be where the threat's going to present, especially in a crime situation. A carjacker more likely is going to present at the driver's side or the passenger side, but most likely it's going to be the driver's side for immediate access to control of the vehicle. Now, what if you find yourself in a situation or you know by your body type that you're not able to bring the weapon across your body? Maybe you sit closer to the steering wheel because you're shorter or any other number of reasons can put, put yourself in a situation. Vehicle type can be dependent that you can't get the gun between you and the steering wheel. Now, as a right-handed shooter, I can come up and follow the profile of the steering wheel to the top, or I can follow the profile of the steering wheel to the bottom and get the gun ready to the, ready for the fight. Same with a left-handed shooter, if I gotta come across the body, I can follow it on the top, I can follow it underneath, or I can do, and of course, another controversial issue is I can bring the gun straight up into a temple index type position, rotate out, and then bring the gun into the fight. So here's my bad guy. He's presenting between the B and the A pillar. He's right at the window. This was what I would consider the most likely situation. This is also the most likely place for you to interact uh, as a driver. Uh, this guy could have started out asking for change, asking for a ride, any kind of situation. I'm at a light. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in stop traffic. I'm in a parking lot. Wherever the situation is, I'm limited in my escape options. Uh, if I have a clear road available, and this guy, in this case, he's standing outside the window with a knife, what can I do? I can just accelerate. I can get out of there. Uh, if there's vehicles in front of me, but I'm clear to the rear, I can just put it in reverse and punch it. He's just got a knife. He's got to break that window, or he's got to get in the vehicle or access the vehicle before he can harm me. Say he's got a gun, or I don't have an escape option. Presentation of the weapon as quickly and efficiently as possible. As a right-handed shooter, I, I have an optimal situation because I can get the gun out, I can bring it across my body, and now he sees the gun, gun trumps knife. If he's a reasonable individual, he's going to rethink his life choices, maybe rethink, rethink his career path, and he's going to leave me alone. No shots fired. Can I count on that? Absolutely not. So I have a split second. Once he recognizes the gun, the window's still intact, is he going to leave? Apparently he's not. He's still there. My first shot is going to have to be through the glass. I really don't have time to put the window down. I'm not really concerned with it. Windows are inexpensive. Life is very expensive. My first round can't be at full extension, and it shouldn't be even if the window is down because I don't want to put the gun within his reach. I want to keep it out of his reach as much as possible. I have to shoot across my chest. I may be able to get my other hand in there. If the window is down, he's already inside the vehicle. I may be fighting with him. Have to press the gun back. This is where precise shooting is very important. 
And I don't mean precise is in a tight shot group. I mean precise is in, in inducing as much trauma as quickly as possible to very critical parts of the body, namely the head. This target right here stands six feet tall to the side of my truck. How big is that head in relation to how close I am to him? This is where shooting is going to occur. So when I fire my rounds, I want to put them in the area of the body most likely to induce immediate incapacitation. That's the head, the brainstem. Shoot him in the nose. If I'm if I just have to get rounds out, I don't have time to do target selection, I'm going to go center mass, center of the target offered as selected, and I'm just going to put as many rounds as I can into his chest and fight my other hand onto the gun for aimed fire. Once the window is down, because I shot it out, or if the window is down to begin with because I had my window open because it's summer, or I rolled my window down to give him some change, or whatever the situation was, it doesn't really change things. The only issue at that point is he has immediate access to the weapon as soon as he sees it so he can reach inside the vehicle. Now, as a left-handed shooter, things are a little more complicated because I have to fight in this corner. I'm going to get my weapon out, but I have to rotate my body. If the seatbelt is still on, can I have an issue bringing the gun past the seatbelt? Absolutely. Time is going to dictate. You may have to fight through the seatbelt because you don't have time to clear it out of the path of the weapon and get it in the fight. Now, can I release the seatbelt? You can. I can release the seatbelt as I do my draw, bring it across my body, and then get the gun up and get it in the fight. The time you have available is going to kind of force the decisions you make and what you're able to do. If he's right there, the window's been broken or the window's already down, I'm already threatened, I see a window to get my weapon in the fight, I might just have time just to get the gun in the fight. Can I bring the gun up and start shooting as soon as I can muzzle towards the door? Absolutely. Are the rounds going to go through the door and hit him? Maybe. They might. I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it, but I'm not going to say it wouldn't happen. It's definitely possible bullets go through doors all the time. My biggest concern is, one, if I'm shooting through the door, even if it's ineffective, it's loud noise, and nobody mistakes the sound of a gunshot usually for anything else, especially in this kind of situation. Shooting through the door, bringing it up, shooting through the glass, I know that my first shot or first shots are going to be from a compressed uh, position, and I might not have both hands on the weapon. Get it up like that, bang, 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 and then fight from there. Now, I have a passenger. This is when things start to get a little complicated and we need to spend more time practicing it this way versus just static alone. Uh, like I said in the beginning, if you, can do it by, if you can do it with passengers in the vehicle, you should have no problem doing it by yourself. Uh, I recognize the threat. My situational awareness is going to give me more time to prepare. Uh, obviously, I, ha I can't control another person's intent, I can't control another person's actions, but the sooner I recognize the threat, the more time I have to key my passenger into the fact that there is one. If they're presenting from the driver's side, it's not that large of an issue as far as weapon safety is concerned, muzzling and things of that nature. If they're presenting on the passenger side, or if they're presenting at the rear window of the vehicle, if you have a four-door car, or, you know, there, there's an access point, there's an uh, ability for the bad guy to access you from that area, or that's just where you choose to engage him at, I have to key my passenger into the fact that there's a threat, uh, especially if they're an armed person and they can assist me, or I have to move them to safety. As a right-handed shooter, Again, gun stayed, shirt pulled up and tucked behind the holster. I can access it without having to clear the lap belt. What do I do about my passenger? Do I just stick the gun straight in front of their face? Do I shove them in the floorboard? Depends on the passenger. It depends on how well you've done your pre-planning. Have you ever had a discussion with this person about how you're going to address a threat in the, effect, in the event that they present on that side of the vehicle? Me personally, if it's someone I don't spend a lot of time with, like, hey, this is John from work, you know, we, he, I'm just giving him a ride home, I don't really know him that well, we haven't gotten into the whole Second Amendment, are you a gun supporter conversation, I'm just going to move him, whether he likes it or not. It's very easy to control the body from the head. All I have to do is get a hand on him and push him down as I make my draw and get my gun up. Now, obviously, I'm going to be screaming, encouraging things, like, get your fucking head down, get your fucking head down. The louder and the more forceful and the, the more choice words I use, the more likely he is to comply because he may not have any idea what's going on, but he knows something's going on, and he's going to listen for further information. Now, can someone resist you? Obviously, if I start to push him down and he doesn't want to go, I don't have a choice. I have to fight behind him. I have to get in the fight. Um, 
depending on the person, I can't predict his intentions. I can't predict his actions, especially if it's someone that I've never talked to about this before. I have no way of knowing how he's going to handle the fact of me putting my hands on him. If I got to grab him by the front of the shirt or whatever I have to do, I need to get him out of the way so I can get the gun in the fight. And that's just dealing with a full grown adult. If you're dealing with a 12 year old boy, 12 year old girl, things are going to be a little more complicated. This is why family planning is so important. Whoever rides in your passenger seat more than once in their lifetime needs to know that in the event that these situations take place, what they can expect you to do. Now this is a situation where as a left-handed shooter I would have an advantage because I'm drawing from the outside of the threat. I can right hand the person, my weapon is staged, in the floorboard, down, 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 bring the weapon up, cross the top, and now I can engage my threat. First round's probably going to be through the glass. I may be able to fight both hands onto the gun. Now, as a right-handed shooter, uh, I'm at a disadvantage with the threat presenting on this side of the vehicle, whether it be this window or, or the rear of the vehicle, because I have to find a way to get their head in the floorboard and get my gun in the fight at the same time. I might clear the lap belt if I have time. Uh, I need to, you should practice both ways. Lap belt's off in this situation. I'm able to get my left hand on their shoulder, whatever I have to do. At the same time, the weapon is presenting, moving behind their back, and the gun is in the fight. A full-grown adult, no time present, no time available. Can I shoot in front of their face? Yeah, push the gun straight in front of their face. Um, get the muzzle past their head, engage the threat that way if you have to. I would consider that a very exigent search circumstance, very exigent situation, as in a suddenly presenting threat. You're reasonably sure that you got to get the gun in the fight because someone's going to get hurt. Down, down, down! Down, 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 down! All right, so worst case scenario I would consider is to have a passenger in the rear right or the rear left, but the rear right is my biggest concern because as a rear left, worst case scenario, I can put the vehicle in park, I have no escape route, and I can exit the vehicle to deal with that threat to keep me from having to maneuver inside the vehicle and worry about bringing the gun between the seat and the B-pillar. I don't want to have to do that. So in this situation, how do I get that person out of my clear uh, line of fire? I can't physically reach them until I release the lap belt. Do I draw first? I have a gun in my hand, I have to deal with an individual in the back. What if it's a baby in a car seat? I, I don't have the option of moving them, so I have to work through fighting past them. Worst case scenario, situ All right, so a uh, rear seat passenger uh, fighting through that rear window. It, it, there's no easy way to do this. Uh, and this is one of those situations where no matter which hand you use, which hand you're, you're going to draw from, which side of the body you're going to draw from, you're going to have to release that lap belt. Because if it's a situation where I have a six-year-old girl, six-year-old boy, I have my grandmother, my mother, whoever, someone who's not necessarily uh, cognizant of the threat and someone who I cannot necessarily depend on instantly to, to, to go off my verbals and get out of my line, my line of fire, I have to move them first. Now, should I do that with the weapon in my hand? If I draw from the right and I move, I turn my body and I go to fight my way towards the back seat, what options do I have to clear them out of the way without muzzling them? It's really, really difficult. I might have to shoot directly in front of them. Huge safety concern, obviously, but when it comes to a self-defense situation, this is why practice to proficiency is so important and working in your, your atypical shooting situations where you have an innocent between you and the threat. What are my options? As a left-handed shooter, I can release my lap belt because I'm going to have to. I have to reposition my body. As a right-handed shooter, same story. I'm going to have to be able to turn myself in the vehicle and work and fight in that direction. Can I reach out and grab them and pull them out of the way? Absolutely. In fact, that's what I would highly recommend that you do. In this situation, I can reach back, grab them, pull them down, head into the floorboard, whatever I have to do. And at that point, no matter which hand I use, I can draw, come in straight over top of them, put a hand on them, and keep them down. Now, are there more efficient ways to clear them out of the fight? Yes and no. This is something you should practice. My personal just basic advice is, before you even present the weapon in the fight, if you have time, empty-handed, put, put them down, put them in the deck, positive control, and then bring the weapon into the fight. Left hand extended reach, I can put them down, I can hold their head down, stay down, stay down, stay down, and then I can draw the weapon and fight over their back. And if I have to, keep a hand on them to keep them from popping back up. That's some of the best advice I can give if you have to fight from the driver's seat. Now this is something you can practice on your own with your loved ones to find different ways to approach it. Now to kind of give you a different view of the technique, I'm going to release the lap belt. Right-handed, left-handed, doesn't matter. 
I'm going to reach into the back of the vehicle and pull them down, pull them to the side. Let's say I pull them to the side, push them to the floorboard. Stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down. Weapon is up, out. If I have to come straight up to a temple index, muzzling is going to be a concern. If I have someone in the passenger seat as well, I can't just come straight up like that, can I? I have to be able to atypically bring the weapon into the fight. The muzzle does not exist on rails, pointed in the safest direction possible. I hold their head, hold their back, however I got to do it, and then I'm able to fight past them. If I'm reasonably sure they're going to stay down, I can go to a two-handed grip and fight that way, but I can't count on that unless I get a verbal from them. If they're too young to give a verbal or they're too young to understand the situation, you cannot depend on them being like, yeah, I'll stay down, I'll stay down. Uh, best judgment situation. Presenting the rear right side passenger window, uh, obviously serious concern. My, my, uh, my first choice should be escape if that's an option to me. If I'm able to get the vehicle out of the situation, I should take that choice. That's not an option if they're trying to break through the window, if they've already shattered the glass or what have you. I have that passenger in the rear. Now, a full-grown adult or an older child is going to move away from the danger instinctually. At least we hope so. We can't depend on that, but it's highly likely that they're going to try to get away from the threat that presents to their window. If it's someone who's not aware of the threat or the violence has not begun yet or you're not really sure of the situation but you want to be prepared, you got to reach into the rear of the vehicle and physically move them if you have to. Don't depend on them to move by your verbals. Work your way, fight your way towards the back of the vehicle. If they move on their own, that's great. If they don't, you need to have a hand available to put them down. Get them out of the way. Seat belts released because I have to fight towards the rear of the vehicle. I may end up in the back seat. Whatever I have to do, I got to do it. One thing I will have to mention because it's very possible is if, if the vehicle's still in drive or if you're holding the clutch in on a manual transmission or whatever, do you have time to put the vehicle in park? Uh, I hope so. Not necessarily. What happens if you take your foot off the brake when you fight towards the rear of the vehicle? It's going to roll into the vehicle in front of you. Is that okay? In this situation, I'd say yes. Is it going to stall out and jerk forward in a manual transition? In this situation, I'm not really concerned with property damage. I'm concerned with the defense of life. Very, very, very exigent circumstances. How likely is this situation to happen? Hopefully you never have to know have to fight my way back there. Nothing really changes from the way I demonstrated it, except I obviously have a threat there. The technique is going to be the same, something you should work on, something you should practice on your own, but I have to get back there, have to fight my way to the back seat, however I got to do it. Get your head down, get your head down, get your head down. Got my hand in there, I got to purchase, and now I can bring my body up, bring my weapon into the fight however I have to, get in there and stop the threat. Get down, get down, get down! Now here's something we haven't addressed yet, but we're going to cover it real quick. What if the threat presents at the driver's side rear window, four-door vehicle, or you know he's looking through the back glass on a hatchback or what have you? Why might he be there? Well, if he's ever been involved in a traffic stop or if he's ever dealt with law enforcement, he knows the safest place to stand uh, to be safe from the driver is behind this B pillar because it's hard for me to get the gun in the fight from inside the vehicle. So am I going to fight from inside the vehicle? Absolutely not. Now. My first couple shots might be from the vehicle. As a right-handed shooter, I can come around and get a reasonable shot from this angle. Break the glass out, and then I'm able to get the gun out of the vehicle. If the window's down, obviously it's not an issue. My primary concern uh, is going to be dealing with the threat. I have no means of escape, which is the only reason I'm addressing him. Why might he go to that window? Maybe he's going to break the glass out and grab your laptop bag off the back seat. Whatever the situation is, you recognize a threat, you see he has a weapon, maybe it's a road rage situation, he's beating on the glass. That's where you first recognize the threat. Can I exit the vehicle? You can. It does increase the danger of the situation because you're not safely enclosed inside the vehicle. But if he's got a firearm, that's kind of a moot point. If he has an edged weapon or a bat or something like that, he can break the glass. Uh, you are reasonably safer because he has to physically touch you with that object. If I have to exit the vehicle, as a right-handed shooter, I have a distinct advantage in that I can open the door and shoot at the same time. As a left-handed shooter, what are my options? I open the door with my right hand and I push it open with my knee as I bring the gun into the fight. Now, from that point, I can exit the vehicle if I have to and continue to deal with the threat. Now, this video has covered a lot of information, uh, especially in regards to shooting from inside the vehicle uh, and, then of course, pre-planning because the best gunfight is the one that you don't get in. One of the things that I see, especially when it comes to, to more dynamic or more advanced self-defense techniques, uh, is they're not necessarily tailored for your personal life. 
you need to tailor your practice after you've trained or, or taken a class or just looked at some information such as this video and tailor the information for your everyday life. Think about the situations you find yourself in, how often you travel with other people, things of that nature, and work those things into uh, your, your practice so you can best address the situations that you're most likely to encounter versus the situations that you're least likely to encounter. Everything needs to be as realistic as possible. You gotta find a way to train this both dry fire, just getting used to the techniques, and then working it up to uh, live fire. Uh, find a range where you can, or, you know, an, uh, an open piece of property or whatever you have to find, where you can take your vehicle, you can roll all the windows down, you can set up some really good targets, or you, and you can work these drills to proficiency. Uh, work on your really, your close quarter skills and, and develop that proficient, um, unconscious competence when it comes to applying these self-defense techniques as quickly as possible. I think if you take these skills and you apply them and tailor them to your own personal life, seek out training, you know, take a, take a vehicle defense class, obviously, so you can, you can address the things that weren't covered in this video, because there's a lot of information and I just can't put it all in one video. Work the drills, take the class, the scenarios, get everything, get as much information as you can and apply it to your everyday life, and I think if the situation ever does happen, you're going to be much better prepared and knowing these techniques and knowing these skills and having this information is going to allow you to practice to a higher degree of realistic proficiency. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly. Down, down, down! <clears throat> Hell yeah! Dirt, 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 dirt. What's up, dude? Your knife's made of cardboard. Seriously, not afraid of you.